Hello everyone, welcome to Business School 101. Russia is a land of superlatives. By far, Russia is the world's largest country as it covers nearly twice the territory of Canada, the second largest country. In addition, Russia has been widely described as an energy superpower, as it has one of the largest natural gas, coal, and oil reserves in the world. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Russian government implemented a series of radical economic reforms designed to transform from the central planned economy to the market economy. However, as of 2020, the economic foundation of Russia remains similar to that of which had been developed during the Soviet period. That brings up the questions. What is Russia's general business environment? Can we apply Hofstede's cultural framework to analyze Russia's business culture? Do Russian companies obtain unique organizational cultures or business etiquettes? In this video, I will discuss these topics with you. Section 1. General Business Environment. According to World Bank's data, Russia is the world's 11th largest economy holding a GDP of $1.48 trillion as of 2020. Its GDP per capita was $10,127 in 2020. This is about one-sixth of America's GDP per capita yet is almost equivalent to China. On the Corruption Perception Index, 2021, Russia is ranked 136th out of 180 countries, receiving a score of 29 on a scale from 0 to 100. This suggests that the country's public sector is somewhat corrupt. Russia has been widely described as an energy superpower as it has the world's largest natural gas reserves, the second largest coal reserves, the eighth largest oil reserves, and the largest oil shale reserves in Europe. It is the world's leading natural gas exporter, the second largest natural gas producer, and the second largest oil exporter and producer. As a leading exporter of oil and gas, as well as other minerals and metals, Russia's economy is highly sensitive to swings in world commodity prices. Russia has moved toward a more market-based economy over the 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but government ownership and intervention in business is still common. Section 2. Russia's Hofstede Scores. Hofstede Cultural Framework is one of the most widely used tools to analyze a country's culture. Now, let's check Russia's scores in Hofstede's six-dimension cultural framework. Please keep in mind that the Hofstede score on each dimension ranges on a scale from 0 to 100. Dimension 1. Power distance. Power distance refers to how openly a society or culture either accepts or rejects differences between people, for instance, hierarchies in the workplace, in politics, and so on. Russia, scoring 93, is a nation where power holders are very distant in society. This is underlined by the fact that the largest country in the world is extremely centralized. Two-thirds of all foreign investments go into Moscow, where 80% of all financial potential is concentrated. The huge discrepancy between the less powerful and the more powerful people leads to a great importance of status symbols. Behavior has to reflect and represent the status roles in all areas of business interactions including visits, negotiations, or cooperation. Dimension 2. Individualism. The individualism versus collectivism dimension considers the degree to which societies are integrated into groups, as well as their perceived obligations and dependence on groups. It can also refer to people's tendency to take care of themselves and their immediate circle of family and friends, and in some cases at the expense of the overall society. If Russians plan to go out with their friends they would literally say, we with friends, instead of, I and my friends. If they talk about brothers and sisters it may well be cousins, so a lower score of 39 even finds its manifestations in the language. Family, friends, and not seldom the neighborhood are extremely important to get along with during everyday life's challenges. Relationships are crucial in obtaining information, getting introduced, or successful negotiations in Russia. Dimension 3. Masculinity. The masculinity versus femininity dimension is also referred to as tough versus tender, and it considers the preference of society for achievement, behavior, attitude towards gender equality, and more. Russia's relatively low score of 36 may surprise with regard to its preference for status symbols, but these are in Russia related to the high power distance. At second glance one can see that Russians at workplace as well as when meeting a stranger rather understate their personal achievements, contributions, or capacities. They talk modestly about themselves and scientists, researchers or doctors are most often expected to live on a very modest standard of living. Dominant behavior might be accepted when it comes from the boss, but is not appreciated among peers. Dimension 4. Uncertainty Avoidance. 
The uncertainty avoidance dimension considers the extent to which uncertainty and ambiguity are tolerated. This dimension also considers how unknown situations and unexpected events are dealt with. Scoring 95, Russians feel very much threatened by ambiguous situations, as well as they have established one of the most complex bureaucracies in the world. Detailed planning and briefing is very common. Russians prefer to have context and background information. When Russians interact with strangers, they normally appear very formal and distant because they consider formality is used as a sign of respect. Dimension 5, Long-Term Orientation. The long-term orientation versus short-term orientation dimension considers the extent to which society views its time horizon. Long-term orientation emphasizes perseverance and growth. In contrast, short-term orientation focuses on the near future by delivering short-term success and emphasizing the present. With a very high score of 81, Russia is definitely a country with a pragmatic mindset. In societies with a pragmatic orientation, people believe that truth depends very much on situation, context and time. They show an ability to adapt traditions easily to changing conditions, creating a strong propensity to save and invest. Thriftiness and perseverance comes in achieving results. Dimension 6, Indulgence. Indulgence indicates that a society allows relatively free gratification related to having fun in life. Conversely, restraint indicates that a society suppresses gratification of needs and regulates it through social norms. The restrained nature of Russian culture is easily visible through its very low score of 20 in this dimension. Societies with a low score in this dimension have a tendency to use cynicism and pessimism. Also, in contrast to indulgent societies, restrained societies do not put much emphasis on leisure time and control the gratification of their desires. Section 3, Organizational Cultures. Generally, organizational cultures in Russia have two distinct features, hierarchy and camaraderie. Let's discuss them individually. First, hierarchy. Ironically, the ideologically egalitarian policies of communism have bred an extremely hierarchical structure in private and public organizations throughout Russia. The boss is a very distant, powerful figure and is surrounded by visible demonstrations of his or her position. Wealth and status are demonstrated openly and emphasize the difference in authority. Promotions are rewarded, not just financially, but with something such as a bigger office, better car, or other visible privileges. Junior team members are expected to respond immediately to any request by their boss, regardless of any other duties they may have to perform. It is also expected that those in authority will be obvious in their exercise of power. Russian managers are comfortable criticizing openly and making impulsive decisions. In the same way, rewards and positive feedback are given publicly. This can mean that the boss may use a meeting as an opportunity to address an individual's performance. This is uncommon when outsiders are present, but not unheard of. As is expected in hierarchical societies, decisions are usually made at the most senior level. The boss is advised by heads of department, but will make the final decision alone. Disagreement with a senior person is very rarely expressed in public. Decision-making can therefore take a long time as each boss at each stage will decide whether or not to pass the recommendation further up to the next level. It is not uncommon for the senior person to be quite confrontational in a meeting if he or she is not getting their own way. It is appropriate to ask for a break to reconsider your position before continuing the meeting. Second, camaraderie. When you conduct business with Russians, it is important that you build a good rapport and trust with your Russian counterpart. Favors and opportunities are often provided on the basis of emotional trust alone. Personal business relationships can sometimes be the only motivator that helps achieve progress during deadlocks in negotiations. However, developing these kinds of relationships can take some time. Russians like to believe that you are authentic and are often quite focused on understanding what your personal ambitions and goals are, rather than your commercial objectives. One of the fastest ways to build relationships is to drink and speak with them and open up from work and outside of meetings. Please keep in mind that it is often appropriate to bring a small gift when attending a family's home for dinner. Sometimes, indicating your skepticism of overriding authority or excessive bureaucracy can give them the impression that you are honest and critically minded. It can also be helpful to grant them a favor early on in the business relationship. These should be granted as a gesture performed based on your friendship, rather than something done out of weakness. Section 4, Business Etiquettes. Here, I would like to introduce the Russian business etiquettes under two scenarios. Meetings and negotiations. 
First, meetings. 1. You should make appointments well in advance and arrive punctually. However, it is important to remember they may be cancelled on short notice. 2. Never use first names unless you are invited to do so because it is important to respect authority and formality in Russia. 3. You should print business cards in Russian on one side and English on the other. 4. It is common to engage in a long period of socialization before beginning to discuss business. 5. During the meeting, you should avoid topics such as your complaints about Russia, the Holocaust, Tsarism and monarchy, conflicts with ethnic minorities, and comparing Russia to other developing countries. 6. Russians tend not to speak too loudly in public. 7. Be patient and expect meetings to run for a longer duration than scheduled. 8. It is better to provide a long and detailed presentation that gives a solid history of precedent cases on the subject you're talking about. 9. It is wise to follow up meetings with an email clarifying what you have understood to take place. This includes perhaps contacting business partners and customers to reiterate the outcome of the meeting. 10. Although many Russians speak English, they appreciate an interest from foreigners in the Russian language. Therefore, an attempt to learn or at least partially speak with them in Russian is a good idea. 11. Russians don't usually make an immediate decision in a meeting, usually a certain amount of deliberation is done in private afterwards. Second, Negotiations. 1. Russian negotiators are often very experienced. When several people from their business attend a meeting, they speak with one voice. It will usually be clear which among them has authority. 2. They may ask you to speak first to evaluate your position before giving their own. 3. The initial objective they present is usually an understatement of what they expect to achieve. 4. Talk to them as equals and do not come across as condescending. They are quite status conscious. 5. If you have the upper hand, do not overplay it. Though this might be their tactic during negotiations, overemphasizing your superior position can humiliate them. 6. Consider that Russians generally have a positive and courteous listening pattern in meetings. This can give the inaccurate impression that they are interested in the offer being presented. 7. Introduction of new ideas or sudden changes to the plan can cause discomfort. It may put people in an awkward position as they cannot always commit before they have sought approval from higher up. 8. Have in mind that flexibility and willingness to compromise can be perceived as a sign of weakness in Russia. If negotiations come to a deadlock, they tend to be stubborn and prefer to patiently wait it out, unless the other side is especially firm in their position. This can sometimes prompt the other party to grant more concessions out of impatience, giving them the better deal. 9. In any kind of high-pressure situation, consider that they may be more willing than you are to walk away from the deal. 10. They often ask for big concessions without offering many in return. Instead, they may include smaller additions in their initial proposal that they are already prepared to concede. 11. Russians tend to make agreements when the whole settlement is conceptualized but not necessarily worked out in detail. This can lead to difficulties later when working out each step in implementation. Alright, that's all for today's topic. So, how do you think about Russian business culture? Do you have any related experience or story willing to share? Please leave your thoughts in a comment below. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.